Okay, so um, I want to thank you for being here. Um, and we are so excited to have Dr. Travis Dorsch join Jackson Hole Ski and Snowboard for an evening discussing uh, parenting our amazing recreational to elite athletes. Um, Dr. Travis Dorsch is an assistant professor and founding director of the Families and Sport Lab at Utah State University. His research targets um, the people and the contexts that have the potential to influence or be influenced by athletes' behaviors, attitudes, experiences, and outcomes in youth sport. His research has been funded by multiple national organizations, including the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, the NCAA, and the Aspen Institute. Dr. Dorsch has authored more than 65 articles, um, plenty of book chapters and technical reports, and has contributed to more than 110 presentations for local, state, regional, national, and international audiences. His research findings have been highlighted in outlets such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and Time Magazine, and are used by sport governing bodies within the U.S. Olympic movement, recreational and elite youth sport organizations, and sport coaches and parents to construct more development, developmentally appropriate sports contexts and to evaluate the role of youth sport in contemporary society. Um, Dr. Dorsch is a former member of the National Science Board for the President's Council on Sports, Fitness, and Nutrition, a research fellow for the U.S. Center for Mental Health and Sport, and a member of the steering committee for the Utah Olympic Legacy Foundation's Sport 2030 initiative. He was also named to the 2021 Early Career Distinguish Distinguished Scholar by the North American Society for the Psychology of Sport and Physical Activity. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Travis Dorsch, and thanks, Travis, for being here this evening. Uh, thank you so much for the the wonderful, uh, albeit long-winded introduction. Um, it seems like the further I get in my career, the more fun opportunities I have to collaborate with wonderfully smart people all across the country, people who care deeply uh, about youth sport uh, across a number of different sectors. And uh, in that spirit, I'm really happy to be here tonight and, and to share this talk with the folks who are here live, as well as those who will watch later uh, on their on their own time. So thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Um, as we dive in tonight, I, and I was thinking about kind of framing this talk, I, I wanted to frame it around this idea of antagonists or allies, right? And, and as parents, I think we have the choice to be either or or anywhere in between. And I think those of us who are parents know that sometimes this can vacillate day to day, even hour to hour or minute to minute. But all of us, I think, strive from a place of love to be allies to our children and, and really share their journey for sport and help them grow their love for, for moving their bodies and doing so in a way uh, that makes them excited and happy to continue doing that uh, for really a lifelong uh, uh, you know, pathway towards physical activity. And I think that's one of the great things about, about skiing and boarding and all these winter sports that we're involved in here in your club is that they really can be and should be uh, lifelong activities even beyond the days of competition. I want to transition then in the back half of the talk to talking about some work, speaking about some work that we've done over the past um, couple of years with the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee in building out this quality parenting framework. It's now live. Uh, it's something that they're utilizing from the grassroots to the treetops in terms of athlete development. And we're really proud of this document. And I want to share some kind of core lessons from the document with you tonight. So um, I'm going to not spend a ton of time on this slide because of the uh, wonderful introduction that Laura gave, but but know that you know I am engaged in this on a daily basis as a professional, as the founding director of the Families and Sport Lab. Our, our research really does look at all these, these micro to macro systems that influence athletes' experiences in sport uh, and, and, and really trying to then translate that research that we do uh, in the spirit of the land-grant mission of Utah State University, translate that to the key stakeholders uh, and the boots on the ground, folks like you that are interacting with athletes um, on the daily. Now, I come to this not just through a professional lens, but also through my own personal lens. As a young athlete, I participated in more sports than I can count. Um, my dad was the, the dad that was always out there coaching. My mom was the mom that was making sure everything ran smoothly behind the scenes, much like a number of American families. Um, I did it all. Uh, in high school, I pared that down to four core sports, mostly ball and team sports. Um, was always a skier, never a ski racer. 
um, kind of did that in the off time in the down season, but played football, basketball, baseball, and ran track and field, um, kind of all the offerings that you would expect at a, at a typical um, high school level. In college, I was fortunate enough to continue playing two of those sports, um, football and baseball, and was fortunate enough to then have um, a short three-year career playing professional football at the end of all that. Um, so really, I see sport, I see what I'll call youth sport broadly, but I see it through a number of different lessons from the four or five-year-old just getting their feet wet and, and figuring out what they're good at and what they love all the way through the most elite levels of competition. As I've transitioned out of that role um, of being an athlete, uh, I've taken on two even more rewarding roles, um, first and foremost as a parent to, to my littles. Um, Josie, who's um, now nine, these pictures are from a couple of years ago. Josie's now nine and Bridger um, is now seven and they are just the life and, and blood of our family. And they, you know, we get to follow them around the country as they develop their passions now for all different kinds of things. They're, they're, they're skiing, they're little alpine racers, they play hockey, uh, they do dance, soccer, flag football, baseball, um, basketball, you name it. They're kind of following it in our footsteps in just being introduced to everything and, and finding that pathway that they can fall in love with. Another lens that I've added over the past uh, two or three years as they've gotten into their young little alpine racing careers is having taken over uh, for the longtime director of Cash Valley Ski Team, Ignacio Berkner. Um, so now I'm in my third year in that role, um, overseeing a very small um, family focused club of about 30 racers in, in northern Utah. And it's really one of the more uh, stressful, but also rewarding aspects on top of my day job at the university that I get to be around this really strong group all the way from five years old, five year olds to 18 year old gap year students, um, all on one team, all on one club training together in a, in a family focused atmosphere is a lot of fun for me uh, and a chance for me to kind of see my professional world through the lens of a parent, but also on snow as a director and coach. So kind of the, the, the coalescence of really all the hats that I wear coming together. So, and that's actually, uh, ironically, I'm coming to you tonight from the Mountain Modern in Jackson. Uh, our team is up here for, for a training camp at Snow King uh, this weekend. So excited to be here with you. Um, in terms of why I'm here, uh, I got invited uh, not just to ski, although that's going to be a big part of what we do. We're going to be up at uh, JHMR tomorrow. And then, as I mentioned, Snow King for a three-day camp uh, with our with our club over the weekend. But but really, I'm here to help make your club better. And that, that sounds like a bold statement, but I think anytime I get the opportunity and the pleasure of being in front of a key group of stakeholders, um, it's really an opportunity for us to learn with and from each other. Um, and the goal of my visit in that spirit is really to, to enhance the quality of your parenting toolkits. Uh, I see we're having some more people add. This is great. Jumping on the call. Um, but really, each of you come to this experience, uh, you know, with, with a different uh, time, place and goal in mind. Had a chance to talk to some of the parents who were on before we got started today. And, you know, some are on the back end of their parenting careers, if you want to think of it that way. Others may be just at the beginning and many in between. But I think one of the key goals that I'm going to share with you tonight is how do we align our parenting philosophies and behaviors um, with those of our, our kids that are competing and out there participating and also the clubs in which they participate, whether that's multi-sport or whether they've they've narrowed it down um, to being only um, an on-snow athlete at this point in their careers. And then lastly, I want to leave um, leave an impression upon the way that you think about your relationships with your children and their other mentors, whether that be peers or coaches or, or educators in the community, how do you interact with, first and foremost, with your children, but then also with all the other people that are in the orbit of your children to make it just a better experience for everyone involved. And at, and at this point, I, I think it's important, too, that I not just tell you why I'm here, but but why you're here. So for the few folks that, that are on that I can see, um, maybe just just chime in if you want to take yourselves off mute and, and share why you joined us tonight, why this talk appealed to you. What is it about parenting young people in sports that kind of lights your fire? And we have a small enough group, I think you can just take yourself off mute and chime in. That's such a such a great point and such a good question. It was more of a comment, I guess, than a question, but but I think this is a developmental approach, right? We, we talked before the call started that parenting a U8, very different than parenting a, a FIS athlete or, or someone who's now gone off to college. Parenting doesn't end when our kids move up in level. It doesn't end even if they go on to college, as we see with Michaela Schifrin, it doesn't end when you're the best in the world. 
Um, so, so how do we do that effectively and in a developmentally appropriate way? I think that's great. And we're going to touch on some of that today and, and, and maybe you and I can connect after as well. We do have some resources we've worked on for, um, the NCAA that, that might be more beneficial to you now with the sun skiing at the college level. So let's connect on that. Um, I think I, I wish all stakeholders, all individuals who surround the athletes that are competing thought about the integration of their influence with the parents as well, because it really is a system or a cocoon that surrounds these young people. And to the extent that that system can work in an organized way um, and have sort of a, a confluence of goals and approaches, um, it makes life so much easier on the athlete who's then not having, you know, seven different people to answer to who have seven different worldviews and approaches to, to their participation and competition. So I think it's important as we as we frame the talk tonight that we understand that sport is, especially in Western culture, but really across the world, one of the most powerful contexts that we can parent in. It's, it's a context where we get to see our kids strive and thrive. Um, and that's not true necessarily of school. We don't get to watch them take their math tests or practice for that ballet recital or piano recital. Um, you know, but in sport, we often get to see them train. We definitely get to see them compete and demonstrate uh, the things that they've been working so hard on. And that creates this interesting um, context, both for young people and for the parents. And in that way, it touches the lives not only of millions of youth, but of millions of families across our country and across the world. And having said that, I mean, parents just have a huge responsibility then. And this is where I, I think when you when you shared earlier your story, Abby, it, it struck me that we have such a, a great fiduciary responsibility as parents to ensure that we're putting our kids in the best uh, in the best places to ensure that sport is structured in a way that that helps them develop in appropriate ways. We all have goals. I'm going to ask you about some of your goals later on, but we want to match our goals, the, the children's goals, and then of course the context that we put them in. We would hate, right, to be a, uh, to be sharing goals about I want my kids to have fun and, and learn new skills and not really hang too much on competition. But then we go put them into the the fifteen thousand dollar program that is all about competition. So we want that alignment, and I'm going to talk about that alignment through a developmental lens a little bit later in the talk. Now, a question that I, I sort of wanted to frame this with, and I'm not going to ask you to, to share anything here, but this is something you can just think about in a rhetorical way, is why your athletes participate. And have you even asked them that question? You know, what is it that fires them up? What What is it that gets them going? And if you haven't asked them that question, I would I would encourage you to do so, whether you're at the at the starting gate right now or your kids are at the very end. Us knowing as parents why our young people are engaged in the first place helps us be better parents to them. And this is not just a conversation you can have once because the answer will change. This is a conversation we need to have, you know, yearly, seasonally, uh, monthly, weekly, sometimes even daily. Why are you here? And it also helps the athlete. It doesn't just help us by giving us information as parents, but it helps the athlete sort of recenter and understand that on bad days or good days and everything in between, that their core reason for participation can still be right term deemed success, no matter where they are on the podium or in last place, right? What their goals are, we can focus on that as parents and help them achieve that as parents. Now, if we take a step back, let's look at this kind of from, from 40,000 feet here for a moment in terms of what the literature says about why athletes participate. And this is athletes from, again, the grassroots to the treetops. U6 to Olympians. When we ask people why they engage in certain activities, the human nature that comes through is we all want to demonstrate competence in the in the case of sport, physical competence. But look, I, I'm giving a talk tonight. I want to be a great speaker for you. All of you have various roles, whether that's as a spouse or a partner or an employee or a director of a club or whatever it might be. In those roles, we all want to be successful. We want to demonstrate competence. And athletes are no different. Nobody wants to do things, excuse my non-scientific language here, nobody wants to do things that they suck at. And if you do, your goal is to get better, right? What we want to do ultimately is demonstrate competence, either through growth or through being, quote unquote, good at what we do. 
And it feels good for athletes. Again, grassroots to treetops, it feels good for athletes to execute a new skill or movement, right? Think about think about the borders, the big mountain people that pull off that, that trick for the first time and the endorphins that come with that, the excitement that comes with that from the athlete's perspective, how fired up a coach gets when they see their athlete begin to and then ultimately master a new skill. All that is really important and perhaps even the most important thing um, that athletes experience in sports. So, so we want to put them as parents as coaches, as club leaders, we want to put them in context where they can demonstrate, if not success, at least growth towards success uh, in what they're doing. The second reason athletes participate is to attain approval. And as much as we, we might want to skirt around that conversation in terms of not thinking that young people want to seek their parents' approval, it is a real thing. And it's developmentally appropriate for young people to seek, first and foremost, the approval of their parents, and then as they transition into and through adolescence, the approval of their peers. And as they trans transition out of adolescence into young adulthood, the approval of trusted mentors like coaches. And that's really a developmental sequencing that we know to be true in sport as well. And it feels good, you guys. It really feels good whether you're the, the last player on the basketball team or the, the, the skier who's kind of struggling uh, with, with, with things on the slopes. It feels good to make progress right towards mastery and see that glimmer in the eye or that smile or that pat on the back or that approval approval thumbs up from a peer from a coach or from a parent and we all want that in sport and then the third reason and 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 maybe I'll argue with what I said earlier and this might actually be the most important and that is simple enjoyment we all as humans enjoy moving our bodies in different ways and that's why people gravitate towards different sports but when we find that sport or that, that physical activity opportunity that we truly love, we want to move our bodies and enjoy the embodied experience of being an athlete, whatever that means to us, right? It simply feels good to do things with our bodies. And this, I mean, the study of this goes back to the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans who, you know, their, their philosophers would study bodily movements. And this is why sport was such a big part of those cultures and has continued to be a big part of Western culture today because it simply feels good to move our bodies um, in ways that foster enjoyment, okay? So with these three reasons or rationales for why athletes participate, I wanna bring it back to the group now and, and I'll, I'll, I'll have you think about this again, sort of a rhetorical question. What's most important in sport? And again, we're all maybe at different developmental phases here. We might have kids of different ages at different points in time in their careers. We come to it oftentimes with, with our own sport playing career as parents or grandparents or club directors or community leaders as well. So we all have a different lens or worldview here. But if you could answer this in a word or two, and, and feel free to throw in a chat to talk to your, if you're, if you're on the screen together with somebody, you can talk to them about it. But what's most important in sport? I have my answers. I don't want to I don't want to cloud your judgment, though, or, or take away from your worldview here. So, so again, think on this for, for five or 10 seconds, and we're going to come back to this later on when I ask you to think about your actual parenting philosophy, because what's most important in sport to you should be the driver of your parenting philosophy. So we'll come back to the answer to this question. Now, having said all this, right, we talked about moving your body, we talked about enjoyment, we talked about demonstrating competence. I do understand that elite sport has a unique set of, of circumstances and a unique sort of context that surrounds it. And in many ways, um, the ski club here in town, the ski and snowboard club here in town has an elite component to it, as do many across the country. And with that, comes the addition of, you know, a high level focus, right, of, of developing athletes to really achieve at an elite level in competitive settings. We can't skirt the idea that talent identification is important, that from the time kids are U8s, we are looking to improve them compared to their former selves, but also compared to their contemporaries who are skiing with and against them. Expert coaching comes into play. And of course, that's not cheap. And when we bring in, you know, money into the equation as parents and families, we have a whole different set um, now of expectations that come with participation and competition. There are those high expectations and the financial commitment and the competitive exposure. And very quickly, sport can be something that goes from the enjoyment in the here and now to a means to a certain end or the expectations of a certain end that might be down the road at the end of the tunnel. So I don't want to ignore this, 
But I also don't want to put it on such a pedestal that this becomes the only end goal. Because I think there is, um, I don't think there's mutual um, exclusiveness or exclusivity between those three goals that I just shared with you and participating at an elite and competing at an elite level. And I'm going to share some of the reasons why as we move forward. But nonetheless, when we look at elite youth sport, it kind of sets up this important conundrum, right? Do we value, do we privilege competitive success, however we might define that? Or do we value and privilege the development of the whole athlete? And do those, again, have to be mutually exclusive? I'm, I'm sort of hinting or foreshadowing at where we're going here. And I think in a lot of elite clubs where money and resources are high and coaching is at, a, at an elite level, we tend to kind of push up on the scale here for competitive success and down on the, the typical developmental outcomes that we might associate with, with youth sport, at the, especially at the youngest levels. The alternative is that we put our kids into a bunch of rec programs where competitive success is not necessarily valued, but development is learning all of those really important life lessons that we often associate with sport participation and competition. And I would argue tonight that it's not actually a conundrum. Let's cross that out. That competitive success and development actually go hand in hand, that we can accomplish both together when we focus on both together. And what I'd like to focus on for the remainder of the talk is this idea of transformational parenting. And look, this idea of transformational parenting, we can put in whatever role we want. It can be transformational coaching. It can be transformational academic advisor. It can be transformational friendship. Okay, I'm going to share with you some, some, some principles that I know to be true from the science in terms of how we can be transformational in the relationships that we have with athletes such that they can achieve a lot of competitive success, at least to the ceiling of their ability, as well as really innumerable um, rates of development in terms of the good people that they will become through their sport participation. So what do I mean when I say transformational? I mean, I think that's a word that we all sort of understand and, and can appreciate, but when we, when we put it in the context of transformational parenting, it's really a child-centered practice whereby parents develop athletes into leaders, okay, through behaviors designed to empower, inspire, and challenge. And I love those words. If you can hang your hat on something from tonight's talk as parents, empower your children, inspire your children, and challenge your children, okay? Because they are, I use the word here purposefully, they are future leaders. They are the future coaches. They are the future directors. They're the future community leaders in terms of, you know, when it's our time to step aside and turn the world over to them, the lessons that they're learning today as U8s, 10s, 12s, 14s, fist skiers, college skiers, young adults, those lessons that they're learning will be their toolkit when they take the reins uh, in the next generation. So we need to do a good and purposeful job of being transformational in our parenting styles and approaches. And when we think about transformational uh, parenting, it's really but, but sort of one approach or outcome, however you want to look at it, on this kind of two by two matrix of how effective are you as a parent, which is of course lies on the vertical axis here. And then how engaged are you as a parent? And I think as you think about your peers, your parent peers on the club or those you know in the community, some are more or less effective and some are more or less engaged. So let's look at, at kind of this full rate, what I call the full range model of parenting behaviors here. We've all met or known, hopefully we aren't um, the toxic parent but toxicity in parenting is something that absolutely comes from a parent who's very engaged. This usually comes from a place of love, right? They, they want so much to see their children have success, but they're ineffective in their strategies at doing so. And toxicity comes in the form of uh, a demandingness without support. It comes in the form of yelling and expectations without the scaffolding. It comes in the form of um, you know, expectations towards perfectionism, right? That there's no room for growth and learning and failure. Um, so again, this comes from a place of wanting to see our children succeed, but not necessarily having the toolkit to do so. On the other side of the spectrum, and this can be, this can kind of range on the, the scale of effectiveness. It can be more or less effective. Um, 
but but definitely on the on the left hand scale of engagement in terms of not being so engaged this idea of laissez faire parenting this this sort of i'm going to kind of step aside and 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 let my children experience the free range if you will and make their own decisions and learn to succeed and fail on their own and this is definitely a common parenting strategy both in and out of sport but where that leaves our children is to have to make all the mistakes themselves and not be able to learn from the mistakes that we've already made or that we've seen others make right and this is definitely an approach to parenting that that has some merit because it does allow our children to to gain independence there are certain good things about this um but also when we take this hands off approach it allows them maybe to make more mistakes than needed to get to that desired end goal neutral parents sit kind of right in the middle they're they're sort of doing the bare minimum. They're not really doing anything that would mess their children up, but they're also not necessarily doing anything that would allow them to find their ceiling of great strengths and, and potential. Um, they, they vacillate on the scale of effectiveness and ineffectiveness and engagement and disengagement. Transactional parents, I think, where is where a lot of us lie on the day-to-day, -day, right? And, and transactional parenting is basically a quid pro quo occasion where I do something for my child and I expect something in return, right? I send them to a ski camp and I expect them to come back and perform better. I invest in uh, their gear or their coaching or their off-season strength and conditioning and I expect them to make physical and mental jumps into the next season. Um, I, I, I do their laundry. I, I take care of their nutrition. I, I do all the things that we have to do as parents, all those hats that we have to wear. And then because of that, I expect things in return, right? So think of it in terms of a transaction at the supermarket. You take the food, I give you the money, right? I give you the money, I take the food. It's the same in parenting. I do this for you. I expect you to do this for me. Again, some value in that, some life lesson in that. Parents are engaged at the very least, but effect effectiveness, it can be argued, right? And it can be different across different children. So what I'll argue tonight is that up here in the upper right corner, which you know we were moving towards, is this idea of transformational parenting, where we are engaged, where we are effective in our parenting. And what I haven't given you yet is the punchline as to why we're effective. And that's where we're going to spend kind of the rest of the talk tonight. Okay. So transformational parenting is really important because we know from science that it works. We've studied this in the workplace. We've studied this in educational settings, and we've studied it in sports. And when parents are more transformational in their approach, it really changes how their athletes feel about what they do in, in the case of all of us tonight, winter sports. So it changes that feeling or that love for sport, that love of our bodily movement that we talked about as being important earlier on. It changes how athletes feel about themselves. It gives them the self-efficacy to know that, that, that mom and or dad or any, any of my support system are there for me, but also that they're giving me enough independence to let me find my own journey, right? And it also changes how athletes feel about those other relationships around them, how they approach peer relationships, how they approach their coaches in terms of, of taking that coaching relationship. And then as people move to more elite levels, that kind of reciprocal relationship between athlete and coach. And then also the environment. How much do I actually love what I'm doing? Okay, so transformational parenting can affect all of this in a really positive way. Having said all of that, we set out three years ago in collaboration with the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee to develop a framework around this idea of transformational parenting um, that could live in perpetuity for all the parents who are coming up at the grassroots level and for all the folks that are living at the elite levels. And I think anytime we see the flag and the rings on something, we tend to think that it's only for those elite level competitors who are representing our, our country on the national and international stage. And this document is not that. It, of course, applies to them, um, but it's really, again, grassroots to treetops. And we want we wanted this to be specific enough to give some, some guiding principles to, to anybody and everybody, but also broad enough that it would apply uh, in terms of lessons to those at the highest and lowest levels. Now, I'll leave this um, QR code up, or you can come back to this point in the video if you'd like to download um, a copy of the framework. So let's talk about the how of transformational parenting. I've kind of introduced the topic. I've defined it a little bit, but I haven't really given you the nuts and bolts of, okay, like, thanks, Dr. Dorsch, but like, how do I engage in transformational parenting? And I love this picture. It's it's um, a thousand words, right? But based on a picture here, but I, I see the parent over and kind of behind the athlete's shoulder. 
suggesting through some nonverbal communication strategies here that, hey, I'm behind you, I'm supporting you. But as the athlete looks off potentially at the course or potentially at another competitor that's out there on the course, um, you know, you can sort of see that the, it's not the parent's journey here. The parent believes and feels that, that they need to be behind the athlete, supporting the athlete, potentially there in their ear if they need something. But it's all about what the athlete sees and feels and hears and does on the snow. And of course, I'm, I'm putting a lot of words in here that maybe aren't in the act. This is one still photograph. Uh, but but I use this very much on purpose to demonstrate that parents are always involved to to a greater or lesser extent, depending on the age and ability of the child. But that involvement doesn't really ever end, whether you're there helping buckle boots at the earliest years or you're there simply as a fan and supporter and voice on the other end of the line later, uh, later in the athlete's years. Parenting is really, really important. So when we talk about the idea of transformational parenting, I wanted to kind of frame it in terms of four jobs, let's call them jobs that I would encourage parents to take on. And the first job that can be transformational in where children ultimately go is to provide athletes opportunities. That can come in the form of multi-sport participation. It can come in the form of opportunities, even within a sport to explore, innovate, make their own decisions. Um, at the youngest years, I, I mentioned earlier, I have a nine and a seven-year-old, uh, and I do a lot of coaching with our, our U eights, tens, and twelves, so kind of the younger end of the spectrum. One way that I do this on the slopes is to um, allow the kids on the team to choose what run we're going to do, whether we're going to be on piste or whether we're going to jump off into the, the moguls or whether we're going to go in the trees or how much we might train, what kind of training we might do. Now, this is not the prisoners completely running the asylum. You also have to have a parenting strategy and a coaching strategy and a plan for what you might do. But to the extent that you can provide some autonomy, right, some volition in what's happening, it becomes really powerful. And that's not only through our actions, but through our communication strategies as well. So as parents, thinking about autonomy, supportive communication strategies and patterns, right? It might be a simple question um, in, in the off season of, hey, are you excited to race again this season? And then follow up with, with why or how much training do you want to do? Do you want to be on the two-day plan, the four-day plan? Are you ready to jump into the six-day plan? Where are you at as an athlete and how can I support that um, goal for you as an athlete? What races do you want to compete in, right? How far do you want to travel? How important is it to you? All of these types of questions allow then us as parents to do what I'm going to ask you to do on the next slide, and that is align our goals to our children's goals and that of the club and coach. You see, this is a really powerful opportunity for you because we all want our kids to be committed. But I have so many parents ask me, how do I get my kids to be committed? Coaches too. And I can tell you from decades and decades of science and the motivational literature that there's a very... Um, noticeable sequence of events that happens when you treat children in an autonomy supportive way. In other words, when we support their volition and choice and autonomy in what it is they're doing, they develop and build and grow intrinsic motivation, right? The idea that I'm doing this for me, not for you, dad, or you, mom, or you, coach, or you, community, or you, country. I'm doing this because I absolutely freaking love it. OK, and when we develop that intrinsic motivation, we enjoy our sport participation and competition more, no matter the result, whether we finish top of the podium or last, we enjoy the process of competing and participating. And when that enjoyment is there, we ultimately are more committed to do it. OK, so the way we get more commitment is not to spend more money. It's not to yell. It's not to put them in the best camp or hire them the best coach or give them the best equipment or move to Jackson or Aspen or Bozeman or Vail. Right. It's to develop a love of sport, a love of moving bodies in a way that will allow them to enjoy it and stay committed to it. And it's the athletes who are committed that are then going to go on and do big things in the sport. Okay, So provide those opportunities to let them fall in love. A second parent's job is to align their expectations, as I mentioned, to their athletes' desires and make sure that you're both on the same page as the club and coach. There needs to be this recursive cycle um, not only of sort of philosophy and belief, but also of communication in terms of, hey, are we all on the same page here in terms of what we're trying to accomplish? And this gives parents a really nice opportunity to be introspective in what they're doing, right? What kind of goals do I have for my athlete, right? Looking in the mirror and asking yourself that can be really powerful and important. What goals does my child have in sport? And is there alignment between the two, right? 
And if there's not alignment, am I supporting my goals or am I supporting my child's goals first and foremost, right? And then ultimately do those goals align with the opportunities that I'm providing, which I asked you to do in your, in your first job, provide opportunities, but those opportunities need to be aligned, right? They need to be aligned. The third parenting job is to not only encourage, but provide space for your athletes to share openly and often. And if that's not with you, if that's not your relationship, make sure they have a peer or a coach or a mentor or a teacher that they can share with. But we, we need to ensure that our children have a space to communicate openly and often about their experiences and outcomes, good, bad, indifferent. They have to have that space. That space can be at the venue. I don't encourage that. I think we all need a cooling off period as athletes. I don't encourage parents to like dig in and talk five minutes after the race about what the athlete did well or bad. Uh, but it, it can be at the venue. It can be in the car. It can be at the kitchen table. Um, it can be really anywhere. And this is kind of a, a family decision and a family conversation around where and when is the best time um, to engage. You know, some athletes only need five minutes to cool off. Uh, some might need 24 hours, right? And, and and you as a parent, it's your job to know what your athlete needs. Um, it's also your job to know, you know, how do I how do I support the type of communication that, that they need? Some athletes need more talking, some need more listening, some need a combination of both. But first and foremost, you need to be a great active listener, right? Become a great listener, make that a strength of yours to listen actively and then respond in turn when it's needed. Demonstrate understanding and empathy. Many of us have been athletes. Some of us haven't. Uh, likely none of us are anymore. So demonstrate understanding and empathy that this is the athlete's journey and we are there to support them, right? They are not there to do well because we spent a lot of money on them or got them the best coach or the best equipment. We are there to support them in their journey. And that can be awfully difficult um, if we all, I think, look in the mirror and admit to ourselves that in a sport, especially like winter sports that we're talking about tonight, um, alpine skiing, I know best among the sports that you offer, it's not cheap. And when you give money to your financial advisor, you want him to turn it into something. You want some ROI on that money. And the same is true in sports if we let our human nature talk. Now, we all have uh, well-developed frontal lobes as adults, and we need to be able to kind of hit the brakes on that conversation around, wow, like we got you a great coach. We put you in that off-season program. You know, why aren't we seeing results? That may come front of mind. But that's not the conversation that needs to be had. We need to empathize with and understand that our children's journey is going to have peaks and valleys and that we are there to support them through it all, okay? One thing I love to talk about with young kids, are you eights, are you tens even, especially for me, I'm six, seven. Um, when I get down and talk to my little guy, I usually get on one knee, whether I'm on snow, I'll get out of a ski and I'll get onto one knee. Whether we're at home, I often get down and, and do a catcher squat or even sit down on the floor with them because that looking eye to eye with an athlete brings you down. It's just a subtle way of saying, hey, we are on the same level here. We are in this together. It's not dad and, and Bridger. It's, you know, we are here talking about your journey together and I'm here with you. I'm here to support you. So something as very as something as small in the nonverbal form of communication as a coach getting out of one ski and getting down on a knee and talking to a small athlete eye to eye, pulling the goggles up, uh, you know, making that eye contact can be really powerful and gives that athlete a space. Uh, safe space to communicate with their coach, parent, or whomever it might be. Okay. And the last job that I want to talk about, job number four, is to engage purposefully and with care. Um, this kind of builds off what I said on the last slide. You know, three minutes after the second run and your skier skis out and they're now out of the competition is not the right time to ask them what the hell went wrong. Um, there's actually never a good time to ask them what the hell went wrong. But in engaging, especially in those, those moments of competition or immediately after competition, engaging purposefully, whether with your athlete or whether with your athlete's coach or whether with a competitor or a competitor's parents or a race official or a director, um, be purposeful about all of your communication and do so with care. Sometimes it's better to, to take a breath, not only count to 10, but maybe count to 10 minutes. Um, and then, you know, have that conversation in a, in a very... Um, approachable way in a very mature way. We all want to have answers, um, but there are certain times and places to, to seek those answers. Okay. And I'll, I'll share this quote with you. Um, someone shared with me, so it's stolen, but this is why I have it in quotes. If you can't spot that parent, you are that parent. And I had someone tell that to me once about their club and I, I, I find some truth in it. And I think we're all smiling because there is some truth there 
that every club has one. Many clubs have more than one. And if you can't spot him, you might be him. Um, but you need to ask yourself again, back to this idea of, of introspection for parents. Here's some homework for you. Asking yourself questions like, am I providing or denying my athlete control and ownership of, of their experience? It is their experience in sport. Is the quality and quantity of my involvement allowing my athlete to thrive? Or am I stifling that growth? I need to know my role, right? One of my, one of my baseball coaches growing up always said, know your role, right? You might be the starting pitcher. You might be the, the, the star hitter. You might be the 25th guy in the bench who only sees a couple innings a week. But if you know your role, you can master your role. So as a parent, know your role. What are you? Are you the, the chauffeur, the nutritionist, the, the sleep therapist, um, the sports psychologist, um, the, the, the purchaser of all the equipment, right? Those are all a lot of roles that parents have. And we should, we should own those roles. Are we there as a, as a shoulder for our kid to cry on or an ear for them to talk to? Or are our kids ready to kind of be more on their own and we're simply in the backdrop, right? So know your role and master that role. And then ultimately prioritizing the growth, psychological, socio-emotional, not just of your athletes, this is the kicker here, guys, but of their teammates, be in it for the team. And yes, even their competitors, right? I love skiing so much. I've fallen in love with the sport over the past many years since my kids have gotten into it because for the most part, parents are super psyched when other kids ski well, whether it's kids on their team or kids on other teams. We just wanna see kids out here having fun. And sure, maybe the, there's that voice in the back of your head that's like, wow, my kid could do better if the other kids didn't, but that's not what this sport is all about. It's about our kids maximizing their potential and wherever they fall in the spectrum of top of podium to last place, we gotta be happy for that journey for them and being happy for all of their teammates' journeys and yes, even their competitors, especially Cash Valley when we see you guys at uh, IMD Champs, all right? Perfect. These are four... Really, really uh, purposeful jobs that we can take on as parents, really key core ways that we can think about our engagement with our athletes, with their coaches, and with the clubs and their communities, all right? And I want to share here for a moment, I'm going to move your beautiful pictures in the Zoom world here up so I can read this quote to you, but this comes directly from the Quality Parenting Framework, which of course I co-authored with, with many wonderful scholars around the world. The appropriate quality of parent involvement can help youth reach their athletic and human potential while fostering a lifelong love of sport and physical activity. Now, these are things I've talked about so far in the talk, right? Help youth not only reach their athletic potential, but also their human potential. And when skiing is done, whether that's as a 12-year-old or whether that's as a 36-year-old who's retiring after four Olympic cycles, we want them to have a lifelong love of sport and physical activity, okay? When parents' involvement lacks this quality, maladaptive outcomes such as dropout, injury, and burnout are more likely to occur. So directly or indirectly, you as parents and the way that you involve yourselves in the lives of your young skiers and boarders and athletes in general has an opportunity to either push them towards their potential ceiling and or leave them in a place where dropout, injury, and burnout are more likely to occur. And that's a huge responsibility. And it's a responsibility that you have to be intentional about, right? So becoming a transformational parent requires being an intentional parent. And so I want to spend the next few minutes here talking about parenting philosophies. And I'm going to have you guys um, work on a short parenting philosophy. So begin thinking backwards towards at the beginning of the talk when I asked you what it meant to be an excellent parent. And I want you to keep those words in mind because we're going to put it into a paragraph here in a moment. But a parenting philosophy basically describes how you're going to approach your role within your family, across the team, and then within the broader organization. And maybe even we could extend that to the community, especially a small tight-knit community like Jackson. A parenting philosophy reflects three things. It reflects your beliefs, your values, and your standards. Now, notice that none of those are sport-specific, right? So your parenting philosophy is bigger than sport. In fact, your sport parenting philosophy should be driven by your broader general parenting philosophy in terms of your beliefs, values, and standards. And it really sets the table for what you hope your child gets out of their sport experience. If I were to ask you that question, right, what do you want your child to get out of sports? Your parenting philosophy should drive that train, okay? Now, I put a few of mine down, and I put them on goggles very purposefully because goggles represent our lens when we're on snow, right? 
And this is sort of the lens through which we approach our parenting on the day to day. And some of mine, as I thought about this before this talk, were respect. I want my kids to respect themselves. I want them to respect their teammates and competitors. And I want them to respect the adults in the room, whether that be coaches, lifties, resort managers, fans, race directors, whomever it might be. I want them to strive for excellence. And excellence is a word that has to be self-defined. And I ask them a lot. <laughs> My nine and seven-year-old ask them a lot. What does excellence mean to you? What are your goals? But excellence is something that's very important to me in my parenting. And that doesn't mean winning. Excellence is not winning. Excellence is striving towards your ceiling. That might be winning. In fact, for my kids, oftentimes they have that potential depending on the race and the field and, and whatever event it might be. But, but that doesn't mean that I'm not happy with them if they don't win. Or even if they're not excellent on a given day, what I want them to strive for is excellence. Trust. I need them to trust themselves in the start gate. I need them to trust their coaches, trust me as a parent. Uh, again, trust those resort managers, trust everybody around them and have that faith that the journey is the journey and they're on it for a reason. Honesty, accountability, integrity are three others that, that I ask my kids um, to have. And I think we should all think about the beliefs, values, and standards that are meaningful to us. And I don't mind if you steal mind. I don't have a co-op on, on these words. There might be similar words or others that are meaningful to you in your parenting journey. But I ask you to write those down right now, to think about those, put them on your device, come back to them, use them when you talk to your kids, okay? I want to give you three real quick examples. I'm just going to run through these real quick and read them. They're from different sports. They're from families and parents that I've worked with in past um, opportunities to engage. But I think there's some benefit from hearing other parenting philosophies before I ask you to create yours. I'm able to foster growth in my children through the numerous opportunities I'm fortunate to provide them. I want them to learn to communicate, to be responsible, and to hold themselves accountable. I believe in nurturing their dreams to be the best on and off the court. This was a basketball dad who shared this quote with me, and you'll see a lot of what we've already talked about today embedded in this quote or this parenting philosophy that I asked him to write. A second example from a soccer dad. I want to help my children develop a passion for the game by providing them with the tools they need to play the game successfully in a positive and safe environment. You could trade game for sport here, and I think this would be an amazing parenting philosophy in skiing, boarding, big mountain, whatever it might be, Nordic. Um, this just really resonates with me in terms of passion for the game and doing so in an environment that's safe, not just physically, but also emotionally, socially, and cognitively for the young people. And then last, from a golf parent, I want to teach my kids that their attitude controls their actions. My parenting goal is to help my kids become the best versions of themselves through sport. In sport, I will hold them accountable to be responsible for their actions and to have integrity, honesty, and trust. Life is more than sport, but I can teach life through sport. This is almost, this one, when I read this, when I heard this, it almost felt like a contract between the parent and himself, right? He's like, look, here's what I'm going to do. I want to teach my kids. My parenting goal is to, in sport, I will hold them, right? He's, he's basically saying, this is my contract to myself as a parent. And I think that's a great way to frame a parenting philosophy. So in our final minutes together, I want to turn the floor over to you. And, and I want to give you maybe, let's say two minutes, 120 seconds. This doesn't have to be more than a few sentences. It can be the start of something that grows and develops over time. But I'd like you to put some words to paper. Again, it can be on your phone. It can be on your computer. It can be on a piece of paper. But let's begin to develop these. And I, I, I'd like to call on the, I, I see three people. Are there more? I'm not quite sure. It looks like actually, yeah, maybe, maybe a ton more. So maybe I'll call on two or three. Um, to read theirs here at the end, but let's go. Let's go two minutes. Um, write some things down, and then we'll we'll wrap it up together with a final thought.
All right, let's go about another minute here as you're, I see some folks writing some things down. <clears throat> Again, this doesn't have to be fully formed and fully fleshed out, but some words to paper, some ideas, even just those core words that I had on the lens of the goggle, what are meaningful or powerful to you in your parenting journey can be a great starting point. Yeah, that's that's an amazing start for yours. I, I, I would love to see that in its fully developed form because I think peers and friendships is something we haven't talked a lot about tonight that are that it's so powerful. Um, yeah, I know a lot of um, elite and now retired skiers and the one thing that they always talk about and the one thing that I see on social media is the relationships. It's the people when they come back for their reunions it's the people that they competed with and against that they have so much respect and love for. It's the community. And so I love that piece of what you shared. And I think I'm already seeing that now with, with my nine-year-old Josie, who now, you know, being on the ski team now for three, four years, like having uh, an integrated group of friends and also being mentored by the older kids. And now even her mentoring some of the young five and six-year-olds that are coming up and in um, is super cool. And I think that we can't lose sight of that, that peer piece. So thank you for sharing that. I, I encourage you, I know we don't have time to sit here and talk about homework together, but I encourage you as a form of homework to really dig in on your parenting philosophies and, and let these evolve over time. They are living documents um, and they will change uh, whether your kids are, are moving in and up uh, or through and out, um, they will change. And that's a good thing. And that's an appropriate thing. So I'll leave you just with a few, what I call A plus parenting behaviors. Like, you know, if I'm grading you as a parent, these are, these are the A plus behaviors. Um, when we're around our kids and especially when they're around their peers, right. And we know how kids are around their peers. They don't want to hear mom or dad or, or coach even, you know, yelling at them for certain things or talking in a stern way about certain things. So I, I like the idea of shouting praise and whispering criticism, um, Criticism is not a bad thing, especially dependent on the kid, right? A lot of kids actually want that form of constructive criticism, but it, it should be private and personal and whispered and, and thoughtful, right? Not in the heat of the moment um, and definitely not at the venue or in the immediate aftermath of a competition. So shout that praise, be loud and proud and, and whisper the criticism when appropriate. Encourage others, be the, be the parent out there who's just fighting and cheering for every kid. Um, one of the things I love most is the kids who aren't really great skiers and you see them improve so much over the course of a season. And I'm getting a little teary even thinking about this right now, but we had a kid last year that, that couldn't even get their skis parallel at the beginning of the season. And, and then at the end of the season in the, in the final event um, finished in the middle of the pack and was just so proud to, to have made so much progress over the course of the season. And to me, that's maybe even more powerful or meaningful than the kid who's able to shave three tenths off, right. And, and finishes top of field, you know, at the final race. So encouraging those kids, encouraging them because that's how we bring them back next year. That's how we give them that opportunity to fall in love with the sport, show even more growth in their, in their athletic journey, but then even as a lifelong journey as, as someone who just loves being out here doing the sport, give away ownership of the experience. I'll put in parentheses at the appropriate time. Um, but give away that ownership. It's your kid's journey. Be there to support them, but but never forget that it's their journey. Model the behavior you ask for. If you want them looking uphill when they when they cross the pist, you look uphill when they cross the pist. If you want them saying thank you to the, the lift operator, you say thank you to the lift operator. Um, if you want them strapping their skis, you strap your skis. You know what I mean? Like we need to be, they look to us as models um, and we need to be those models for them. And I would apply that to coaching as well. So you coaches out there, if you're listening to, um, it's not a do as I say, not as I do. It's a, they're going to do as you do. So so do it wise wisely. And then I, I play on this sort of crossed out welcome here and actually say we should be not only welcoming feedback, but we should be actively seeking feedback. Have a parent peer, have somebody that you can talk to, an accountability partner, if you want to think of it that way, that when you maybe go a little bit sideways off the rails, they can bring you back in and you can do the same for them. Whether that's a family that you love and trust and your kids are friends, right? Be those people for each other. Seek the feedback from your kids about, hey, what am I giving you that you want to need more of? Um, what am I maybe giving you that you don't need and you'd rather I not talk about? Um, your, your kids are the experts in terms of what they need to enhance their sport journey. So seek that feedback from them and from others. And I'll leave you with a final quote um, from the Quality Parenting Framework. 
The quality of a young person's sport experience and the personal assets they're able to develop are shaped by multiple persons and contexts. And among those, the most salient is parents. You have a great responsibility. We have a great responsibility um, to ensure that our kids fall in love with this sport and, and take the reins of that journey for themselves. And, and the most beautiful thing I've seen is when a parent can then take a backseat, take their hands off the wheel and allow their kids to fully embrace and, and love that journey. And they're there to support them. And that's what this is all about, guys, is, is giving the journey and giving life over to them. So I thank you for your attendance tonight. Um, if you find me, I'll be the big six, seven tall guy on the slopes the next four days wearing an orange Cash Valley ski team jacket. Stop me if you see me on a lift at Jackson tomorrow or at Snow King over the weekend. Would love to chat more uh, and introduce you to my beautiful kiddos. And uh, otherwise, we'll see you on the race circuit this winter. So thank you so much.